Well, fundamentally, higher order schemes give us a greater resolving power per degree of freedom. And thus, for the same level of accuracy, we, in principle, need fewer overall degrees of freedom, which is good from a computational cost standpoint. Secondly, the other advantage of going high order is that these degrees of freedom are now clustered inside of these larger elements. Now, of course, this is one of the things which makes mesh generation more challenging, but the benefit of this tight coupling between the degrees of freedom in elements is that compared to a second order finite volume scheme, which just uses relatively simple cells, we have less indirection. And furthermore, the scheme itself requires less memory bandwidth. And I'll talk a little bit later on in this presentation about why this is so important in the context of modern hardware. Now, just to give you a slightly more concrete example of high order and to back up some of those claims I made with regards to the resolving power, here we have two otherwise identical simulations in terms of degree of freedom count with an isentropic Euler vortex in a free stream. One on the left, we're going to add vector simulation using a second order scheme with 25,600 overall degrees of freedom. And on the right, we're going to add vect this vortex using a fourth order accurate scheme with, again, the same number of degrees of freedom, but because these freedom, these degrees of freedom are more tightly coupled inside of an element, we have overall fewer elements, just more degrees of freedom per element. Starting at t equals zero, everything looks pretty much identical. And we march forward one time unit. And since this isentropic Euler vortex is in a free stream, it advects a little bit to the right. We can go again, advect until t equals two, and so on and so forth, until we get to t equals five, at which point the Euler vortex has done one full pass through our periodic domain and is back where it started. Now, in an ideal world, if the, our scheme had no dissipation and no dispersion, we should be right back to our initial condition. And at this point, both schemes appear to be holding up pretty well. Let's go forward now to t is 20, so that's four passes, and we can see while nothing much has changed with the fourth order scheme, the vortex for the second order scheme on the left has started to dissipate out. Going further again to t equals 40, we can see the fourth order, the high order scheme, is still maintaining the vortex almost perfectly, whereas the second order scheme, it's almost unrecognizable. And of course, we can go further to t equals 60, where again, no real change on the high order scheme, but a substantial change for the second order scheme. And by the time we get to t is 180, you can see some slight changes for the fourth order scheme, whereas for the second order scheme, there's pretty much nothing left. And again, these are both simulations with equivalent numbers of degrees of freedom. And so at some level, you can argue they have a comparable computational cost. But if you're being particularly generous, you can say that since the degrees of freedom in the high order scheme are tightly coupled, that the high order scheme is actually cheaper to implement if you do it efficiently. Okay. Now, as has been alluded to earlier on and throughout the day, there are several choices of compact high order scheme that you can employ to get these aforementioned benefits. The scheme we've gone with is the flux reconstruction or FR approach, which was first proposed by H.T. Wynn in 2007. And we went with the scheme because firstly, it's unifying. That is to say, it can recover several existing and known high order schemes as special cases, and is also capable of operating effectively on mixed unstructured grids. This is what we believe is important if these schemes are going to be applied to real world industrial problems. So we've said why high order is important. We've picked a high order scheme that we like and we think shows promise. The next question, and why we're all here today, is 
how do you go about implementing this scheme so it can be used to solve real problems. And for this, we have PyFAR, which is a combination of Python and flux reconstruction. Python being the fact that the majority of the code, quite uniquely, is written in the Python programming language. How is this accomplished? And what can PyFAR do? Well, this is a slide that Peter showed a little bit earlier in his talk, so I won't spend too much attention going over it. But PyFAR, as it currently stands, is capable of solving the compressible and incompressible Navier-Stokes equations using arbitrary order accurate flux reconstruction on mixed unstructured grids. That includes all of the use, usual element types, albeit, as we discussed earlier, with a slight caveat around pyramids. From a time standpoint, we typically use adaptive explicit ruler cutter schemes, although also have support for implicit backwards different formula schemes via this dual time stepping approach. In terms of precision, we can run either single or double precision, and I'll be talking a little about that, a little bit about that in my second talk later. We currently have no explicit subgrid scale models, although that might be subject to change, and you'll be hearing a little bit about that later. And finally, in terms of hardware platforms, we're capable of running on CPU and Xeon Phi clusters, NVIDIA GPU clusters, and AMD GPU clusters, all with complete feature parity and performance portability from a single code base. So the question is, how do we accomplish this? Especially given that Python is not usually regarded as a language that performs particularly well. In fact, its performance for anything computationally intensive is widely regarded as being completely atrocious. So how do we get good performance out of Python and how can we leverage it to target all of these various hardware platforms in an effective manner? And the way in which we really do this and what makes Python somewhat unique is very much summarized in this diagram. What we can see on the upper left is that Python is predominantly used for the setup portion of the code, things like reading in your configuration file, reading in the mesh, all of these, what you might call boilerplate tasks, memory allocation, the tedious stuff, the laborious stuff that Python really does a fantastic job at handling. And then if we look at the flux reconstruction algorithm itself, and we spoke about a little bit about this in the workshop yesterday, the operations required in a flux reconstruction time step really boil down to two separate classes of operations. The first take the form of matrix multiplication kernels that are responsible for shuffling data around inside of an element and perform taking linear combinations of that data. Whereas the second are what I'm terming pointwise nonlinear kernels. These are things such as your flux functions, your Riemann solvers, and the such like. They're the kernels that really encode the physics as it were. Now, matrix multiplies aren't too difficult to handle. They're, it's a known thing. You can explain relatively simply to a computer scientist what a matrix multiply is, and they've got some very snazzy ways of efficiently performing matrix multiplications. Typically, at the coarsest level, you take the vendor-provided linear algebra library, Kubas, MKL, whatever it may be for the hardware you're targeting, and just call a generic matrix multiplication routine. And that typically won't do too badly. We can definitely do better, and I'll talk a little bit about that later in my talk. But at a high level, you can take the matrix multiplication as being a sole problem that's mostly handled by vendor libraries. Thus, all we really need to concern ourselves with is the pointwise nonlinear kernels. And the way we decide to handle this in PyFAR is through an idea known as runtime code generation via a domain specific language. So in PyFAR, these kernels are specified in our own custom, what you might call as in inverted commas, programming language. And then at runtime, a piece of code within PyFAR will translate these into either CUDA kernels for NVIDIA GPUs, OpenCL kernels, predominantly for AMD GPUs, but also for other platforms, or OpenMP annotated C code for CPUs. 
typically a time step might require half a dozen to a dozen such kernels to be generated and translated at runtime. And finally, these kernels, along with the matrix multiply routines, can be called by the Python outer layer. The result being that all of the heavy lifting in PyFR is done by vendor specific or platform specific kernels, not in Python. But we're using the benefits of Python to allow us to implement things such as the domain specific language, handling the translation, and all of the user facing features, which are not performance critical, but where we just want the code to be as simple as possible. And what this allows is what we're terming heterogeneous computing from a homogeneous code base. So PyFart, which is one single code base of maybe 8,000 lines of code all in, can run on everything from a Raspberry Pi to the largest DOE supercomputers, and can also run on heterogeneous configurations. If you've got a mix of CPUs and GPUs, PyFR can split your simulation across the CPUs and GPUs. The idea being, whatever hardware you have, we can make efficient use of. And that's all made possible by the architecture laid out in the previous slide with regards to how we've gone about supporting these different hardware platforms and maintaining performance portability. Furthermore, we've put a lot of effort into PyFR around scalability, both strong and weak scalability. So how we handle so-called distributed, distributed memory parallelism with MPI. And this enables PyFR to scale up to tens of thousands of GPUs with no issue whatsoever. Something that, as Peter mentioned, led us to being shortlisted for the 2016 Gordon Bell Prize. With that, I'd now like to talk about some of the ideas that go into PyFR that enable us to implement the FR approach efficiently in terms of both getting strong and weak scaling and mapping well onto modern hardware, as it's certainly not a trivial thing. And these ideas have very much guided the way in which we do things within PyFR and some of the internal design decisions we've made around the code that constrains what it is and isn't well suited for. The first of these, and this comes back to scaling, is to use non-blocking communication primitives. To give you an example, time to solution, so basically how quickly you can get an answer out, is heavily impacted by the parallel scalability of the code. And this, in turn, is influenced by the amount of communication you have to perform in each time step. For instance, here I have a cylinder mesh that's been partitioned into two domains. So this can run across two MPI ranks. Call it two GPUs, if you will. And in order to do a time step, these ranks have to exchange some data with one another. Specifically, we have to exchange data along this line here. Now, this is pretty good. It's just a relatively shallow halo exchange, vastly better than something you would find if you had to do a Poisson solve or solve any other kind of global implicit system. Now let's say I want my answer quicker, so I'm gonna use four domains. Well, okay, we can do that. Here is the same domain partitioned into four chunks. And let's look at the amount of communication that our single rank has to do. Suddenly, it's doubled up. And we've also got more ranks. And so the aggregate amount of communication going on a time step has increased dramatically. And this continues as you add more and more domains. Thus, if a code is to strong scale, it's essential for it to have a way to overlap communication with computation. So while we're waiting for the relatively slow data exchanges to occur between ranks, which may be on the same physical computer, or maybe connect over some kind of high-speed network, we need to have something else going on. And I'll try and illustrate this as follows. Let's say we've got three chunks of data that our kernels are going to interact with. And we start off with a kernel that does some computation on the first piece of data. Then we need to send and receive some of that data to a neighbor. So in additional code, you do an MPI send, an MPI receive to send part of that array to your neighbors, 
and receive another part from other neighbors. When that's complete, we then run the kernel compute B, which uses that data, followed by a bunch more kernels to interact with some other bits of data in our simulation. And this is often how you'll see a lot of code structured. You do some computation, you then do some MPI send receives, followed by some more computation. The problem is that the computation, uh, sorry, the communication becomes something of a rate limiting step. The idea, however, behind overlapping communication and computation is that if you look closely at the animation, you'll see that kernel C and D, so compute C and compute D, don't interact at all with the data array that MPI is engaging with. In other words, we can run them while the MPI send and receive is happening to get some overlap. Thus, let us consider re-architecting or rearranging our kernels as follows. We have our data sets, we do compute A as before, but then we do a non-blocking send and receive. And while those are going on, we do compute C and compute D. We then have an MPI wait, which waits for the MPI request to finish. And then we do compute B, which interacts with the array that we were MPI sending or receiving from. The benefit here is that we can now get on with computing C and computing D while transferring data over the network allowing us to mask that latency and hence scale our code further. If we wanted to go even further still, we could take advantage of the fact that often when you operate on data arrays, you can special case certain elements in your domain and prioritize them. For example, we might want to consider having each of these domains prioritize doing computation for elements on a boundary with another rank to get them done as soon as possible, as that would allow us to start the MPI non-blocking send and receives as quickly as possible, and then compute the remaining quantities for the rest of the elements inside each domain while the MPI transfer is happening. And again, this will allow us to get more overlap by breaking kernels into multiple pieces and prioritizing certain elements over other elements based on if they are a dependency for an MPI transfer. The next thing that's very important, especially for modern hardware, is arranging data in a cache and vectorization friendly manner. Flux reconstruction in many of its forms is very often a bandwidth bound algorithm. That is to say what limits our performance isn't so much flops, but memory bandwidth. This isn't always the case, and it depends at some level on the element types you're running on, but in many interesting instances, it's a memory bandwidth bound problem. It's therefore important that a code arranges its data in a way which enables us to extract as much memory bandwidth as possible, while also avoiding unnecessary transfers. And this is very heavily impacted by how we choose to arrange quantities in memory. Generally speaking, when you're writing an HPC code, there are three main ways of laying things out in memory, and they are termed AOS, SOA, and AOSOA, which I'll explain now. The first layout, AOS, stands for Array of Structures, and it's what you will typically encounter if you write C code, as it's the most natural. The idea is you have a structure with your variables in it. In this case, I've gone row, row U, and E which are the three quantities you need for the 1D Euler equations. And then you have an array of these structures where the length of the array is however many elements you have. This results in something that looks roughly as follows in memory, where pay attention to the color coding. So we've got density, momentum, energy, density, momentum, energy, and so on and so forth. This data structure is very friendly from a cache standpoint. However, is not so good from a vectorization standpoint, as there's now a stride between adjacent densities, a stride between adjacent momenta, and a stride between adjacent energies. And this makes the code difficult to vectorize, and if we can't vectorize it, we probably can't get 
good memory bandwidth. The alternative layout for this, and this is the one that I would say most codes end up adopting, is the transpose, the structure of arrays format. Here we have a structure, and each element in the structure is an array, and the length of each array is however many elements you have in your simulation. Thus, when you arrange everything out, it looks something like this in memory. The good news here is that it's now trivial to vectorize, as you've now got stride one access between quantities of the same type. The bad news is that it can put pressure on the hardware prefetches, as it appears to the CPU like three separate arrays you're accessing at the same time, whereas the AOS appeared like one array. And secondly, if you ever have to do indirect access, whereas with AOS, one indirect access will get you all of the quantities associated with a point, here you need typically three indirect accesses because the data is just so far away in memory. Again, it looks like three separate unrelated arrays. So it's better, but it's not ideal. Hence, the solution that we've adopted in PyFR is this AOSOA approach, which is a hybrid approach. I'm going to show it here in the case where k is 2, but treat k as a free parameter. The idea is that we have a structure, as before, and each element in that structure is an array of fixed length k, where k is a constant that we pick a priori. And then we have an array of these structures. And the length of that array is NLEs divided by K, but rounded up. Seeing what this looks like in memory, we get something like the following. And the nice thing here is that we still have stride one access between quantities of the same type. Densities are together, momentum are together, energies together are together. And that gets us vectorization, as long as k is chosen to be a multiple of the vector length. However, since k is small and fixed, quantities for elements for within a single element or single point, whatever you want to call it, are still relatively close to each other. They're not stride 1, as in AOS, but they're stride k. And what this means is that the structure is both cache and TLB friendly. So it's convenient for getting good memory bandwidth out when you've got coalesced memory accesses. And when you have to do indirect accesses, you don't pay the same penalty of large strides that you do with SOA. Hence, this is very much what we would say in the UK is the Goldilocks solution. But it comes at the cost of very messy indexing, as figuring out where something is in memory requires divisions, it requires modulus operations, and you shift that, and you divide by that, and you subtract away the number you first thought of, and you get these absolutely horrific looking indexing expressions to find out where things are in memory. The good news in PyFR is we've got a domain specific language that handles all of this, so it really isn't an issue. And finally, it can require a little bit of work to get your compiler to vectorize the resulting code. But you kick it hard enough and it, it usually will. To give an example of the benefit this has, I'm showing an example of PyFR with SOA versus PyFR with AOSOA, AOSOA on the Intel Xeon Phi Knight's Landing, KNL. And what I'm showing is this normalized metric time per degree of freedom per RK stage measured in nanoseconds, with lower being better. And along the y-axis, we have different polynomial orders. And what we can see here is that just making this simple change from our data layouts made a huge impact on the performance on this particular hardware platform, especially at P4, where we can see the time pretty much halves, so our performance doubles just by choosing the right data structure. The final thing I want to talk about is this idea of casting key kernels as performance primitives. 
On modern hardware, it can be extremely difficult to extract a high percentage of peak flops. So even if you have a kernel that is flop rather than memory bandwidth bound, extracting these flops is difficult. And that's predominantly due to the fact that hardware is, at the fundamental level, very quirky. And typically, in order to extract anything above about 20% of peak flops, you need to be writing code that has some underlying knowledge of the hardware that it's going to be running on. And to this end, it's very important, wherever possible, to cast key operations in terms of performance primitives. In other words, code that somebody else has written and optimized. I'll give you an example. In flux reconstruction, we often need to shuffle data around inside an element. A classic example of this is we have data at the green points and we want to interpolate that data to the square points. As we described earlier, this can be framed as a matrix vector product with each square point being some linear combination of every circle. And so you stack all that together and it takes a form of a matrix vector product where your vectors are the circles and the squares, and the matrix is a set of coefficients that relate the two. Now, this operation has a name. It's called a general matrix vector product, or GEMV, which you'd normally write as U vector is some matrix M times V vector. That's nice, because if you take something like a BLAST library, most vendors will provide you an optimized matrix vector product kernel that is already well tuned for their hardware. So abstracting this operation in this matrix form allows us to leverage what the vendors have already done. Now, if we take the liberty of working in transform space for our code, that is to say we do all operations inside some reference elements, then the matrix M is the same for all elements of that particular type. And thus, a sequence of matrix vector products can be cast as one large matrix matrix product, or a GEMM, which I've written here as U equals MV. This is again nice, as I alluded to earlier, most vendors will provide an optimized matrix multiplier routine that works well for their specific piece of hardware and is very finely tuned, whereas writing your own is very challenging, or writing equivalent code that performs as well as a subtraction. Hence, it's very likely that these routines, when called from a suitable vendor-supplied BLAST library, will perform around an order of magnitude better than anything which we could roll by hand. And furthermore, one of the interesting things in FR is that this operator matrix M can sometimes be sparse. Now you may think that's a reason not to use the matrix multiply abstraction and instead try and hand roll some code that takes advantage of the sparsity. But the approach that we found to be most effective is instead to still cast it as a matrix matrix product, but instead use more specialized matrix multiply routines, such as those found in the gimmick library that Pete talked about earlier, or the libxsmm library that's developed by Intel and that we have made substantial contributions to. Even this week, we got some new code into libxsmm that can take account of the way in which the operators in PyFR, or flux reconstruction in general, can be structured and optimize them accordingly. So, in summary, if you want to implement flux reconstruction yourself, use non-blocking communication primitives, arrange data in a way that is cache and vectorization friendly, and wherever possible, cast key kernels as performance primitives and find the best possible library for implementing those performance primitives, ideally one that's maintained by a vendor or someone that has an external interest in the specific piece of hardware that you'll be targeting.